The speaker today is Dr. Rajiv Rasaira. He's an assistant professor in the Department of Brain and Cognitive Sciences at the University of Rochester. His research focuses on the use of different pattern recognition algorithms to investigate the structure of neuronal representations in the human brain with emphasis in linguistic meaning. And today he will be talking to us about computational models of words and sentences to reveal meaning in the brain. Please help me welcome Dr. Raisada. Thank you very much, Javier. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for, for hosting me. I've really been enjoying my, my chats with people today. And uh, I think what I really want to do is spend the whole time just playing with this virtual pointer that some people have. But uh, let me see if I can get this to turn. Is it like a regular keyboard I can? Oh, OK, sorry. OK. Um, I'm pushing the arrow button and it's not. Can I just, is there a keyboard I can use? I don't need to use a clicker. Can I just use this? Let's see if this works. Oh, there you go. Oh, I just needed to click them too. Okay, 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 all right. Okay, great. Okay, okay, thank you. Sorry about the glitches. Okay, so um, I'd, I'd like to start with, um, you know, I think in science we need to ask really kind of, you know, the, the, the profound questions. And so I'm, I'm going to start with one. I'd be very grateful if someone from the audience could actually answer this for me. What, what is the weather going to be tomorrow? This is actually a serious question. I would actually like someone to tell me what the weather's going to be tomorrow. So, yeah. It's not that profound. I, I, I got to fly back. I actually need to know what the weather's going to be tomorrow. Come on, someone tell me. Okay, okay, there you go. Okay. All right, so thank you. Thank you. Okay, so, so, so something just happened in your brain. Okay, so, you know, some sound, you know, I made the, the air wobble a bit and uh, some sounds came out of my mouth and then uh, they were picked up by auditory cortex, which then realized that they were speech and it tried to figure out like the meaning of it, it figured out it was asking something about weather and something to do with time and you know, this thing called tomorrow. And then you, you know, decided, okay, I'm gonna you know, give whatever answer that the weather's the same. And, um, and then you actually took an action and you, you, know, you told me what it was gonna be, for which I'm grateful, thank you. Okay, so you know, all this amazing stuff happened inside your head. Um, and uh, you know, the, the, the sad truth is that we as the human race don't really understand all that much of that. I mean, we, you know, we know, you know, we have ideas about what's going on, but we don't really understand exactly. We, we certainly couldn't build it, okay, in the sense of how the brain does it. Okay, whereas, in, you know, in contrast, uh, the only reason I'm doing this on Alexa is because Alexa actually speaks the answers out loud. Alexa, what's the weather going to be tomorrow? There will be mostly sunny weather, with a high of 47 degrees Fahrenheit and a low of 31 degrees. Pretty good. So, um, so you know, inside this box, well, it, you know, it looks a bit different from the, I use the Alexa app on my phone, but, you know, basically, uh, overtly similar kinds of things happen. You know, some sound hit the microphone, it figured out that it was speech, it had like the kind of wake word, Alexa, you know, here I'm putting meaning in, uh, in scare quotes, right? Because, you know, we don't, you know, Alexa didn't really understand the meaning of what I said. Or, well, I mean, but it did actually give me the right answer. It did, you know, it did achieve, you know, when it, it made some kind of decision, it figured out that I was asking about, um, about the weather. It actually even figured out that I was asking about the weather in Bethesda, Maryland, because I guess it, it got my location off the phone. Um, and it, it made the action of speaking out loud. So it did all that stuff, which, you know, kind of looks a little bit similar to, to what, you know, the, the brain was doing and the person who very helpfully told me what the weather was going to be using their own head. Um, but the big difference is that, you know, we as the human race actually do understand what this, you know, I, I might not. I mean, I have, a, you know, a broad idea, but I don't really know the, you know, the, the mechanics. But the human race really does understand that stuff um, and uh, because it built it, right? And, you know, I mean, these things actually work amazingly. Um, so... 
you know, for people, you know, I'm in you know, cognitive science, cognitive neuroscience, and, um, you know, thinking about language, and, and we have this idea that, you know, we can try and kind of figure out how the brain is working by kind of studying it, sort of trying to reverse engineer it a little bit, and, you know, it's kind of a little bit embarrassing, actually. I mean, I think we have to um, kind of acknowledge that this is, this is where we're at. So, you know, we say, okay, we want to study the brain as an information processing system. And, um, you know, we, we know we're going to reverse engineer it. We're going to try and figure out how this thing got built by millions of years of evolution. Um, and, you know, it also happens to be the case that this thing is, uh, is built out of um, biological substrates and neurons, which have all these interesting connections. But, you know, there is a case to be made, although it's pretty controversial, that if you really just care about the information processing, then all of that stuff is actually not that important. You know, what really matters are what the algorithms are. Is this working okay, by the way? It's sort of flashing a little bit, but uh, I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. Okay. So, um, but, but, you know, but we don't really, um, you know, we as a human race don't really understand, you know, exactly how this works. We certainly don't know the algorithms, except maybe in some very basic cases of, you know, extremely peripheral sensory processing. Um, in the meantime, machine learning has come along. Uh, you know, they're not, they don't try and do any reverse engineering. They're doing forward engineering. They're actually building the things. Um, and they are sort of interested in the brain, some of them. You know, maybe you could have, like, a nice conversation over coffee with them. But they don't really care that much about, about what the details of what the brain is doing. Um, but, you know, their stuff actually works. So, so in cognitive science and cognitive neuroscience, we might say, okay, well, fine. You know, their stuff works, and we don't understand how the brain actually does it. But we kind of gave birth to all these things. I mean, if you think about where these tools came from, they were actually, a lot of them were actually born in cognitive science departments. This is actually true. Back propagation, Jeffrey Hinton, you know, he was, and all these people, Rumor Hart, these were cognitive scientists. They still are in, in many ways. Um, convolutional neural, neural networks really were inspired by the architecture of the visual system in, in, a, in a somewhat loose way. Reinforcement learning, you know, there was like Riscola Wagner model way before people were building, you know, AlphaGo and things like that. So uh, more recently, and I'll be talking about this, distributional semantics was also actually born in the world of cognitive science. And even more recently, uh, which relates to, for instance, work that uh, Tom Mitchell's done and Francisco's done, uh, zero-shot learning, which I'll, we can talk about if you're interested, even more recently, actually, first, in many ways, got developed, actually, in studies of the brain. So you might say, okay, this is great. You know, the, the, you know, we, you know just, we in cognitive science, we in cognitive neuroscience actually did create all this stuff. There just was maybe like a little bit of a time lag of, you know, a few decades before it actually turned into real working systems. Um, but, um, uh, but, you know, I think, it's, I think there's still some major challenges. So, uh, you know, I think what, what people often do these days is they say, and I think this is a good approach, uh, and, you know, I've done it, other people do it as well. They say, you know, here's an algorithm for machine learning that works fairly well, like, for instance, you know, reinforcement learning or something like that. You know, let's look at some brain stuff and see, you know, use this known machine learning algorithm as a kind of model to say, can we find some stuff in the brain that looks kind of like that? And, um, you know, that's a pretty reasonable approach. But notice here that the neuroscience is sort of like riding on the coattails of the machine learning here, right? It, um, and in fact, you know, papers like this come out all the time. And th this slide is actually already out of date. Um, but this is just, a, you know, a, a, a sampling. And these are all, you know, very interesting and worthwhile papers, and I think it's great stuff. But there's a, a lot of work <clears throat> that gets done these days basically saying, you know, let's, uh, let's try and take, take algorithms from machine learning and use them as, as a kind of a template for trying to understand what's going on in the brain. Okay, here's the kind of stuff that you don't see. Or at least I haven't seen it yet. Latest developments in systems neuroscience, a review for machine learning practitioners. What every recurrent neural network researcher needs to know about ascal dendrites. Get a machine learning job using these top 10 facts about NMDA receptor synapses. Nobody, nobody actually does this kind of thing. If, if, if neuroscience was really, was really still leading the way, then these would, these would be like real papers. But, you know, unfortunately they're not. And I say this as a, as a neuroscience. I say this, you know, not out of, out of mockery, but out of, of sorrow, saying that, you know, I think that, you know, if you really want to, you know, the people who are really 
doing the, the best work for actually you know, understanding cognitive processing days, uh, these days are people in machine learning labs, in my, in my personal opinion. Okay. So you know, does that mean we should all just give up and go home? Well, you know, I still have some talk left, so I'm going to argue that the answer is no. Okay. So here's a slightly different approach. So in, we, we still say, you know, here's an algorithm for machine learning that works fairly well. Um, but now let's say, well, let's see where people do better. And there's still lots of room where people do better. I mean, you know, Alexa and stuff works okay, but it's pretty easy to break it, actually. If you ask it anything, anything more complicated than what's the weather tomorrow, you can break it pretty easily. Um, so instead of saying, let's see if we can find stuff in the brain that looks like that, which I actually do think is an interesting and worthwhile thing to do, but I'm going to suggest another thing you can do is, well, let's cross that out and let's say, um, well, let's see how humans are different and how that difference might explain how people do better than machines. Because there's still a big, big gap there, even though sometimes you might read in the media that, you know, superhuman levels of machine performance have already been achieved. Well, you know, not really. Okay, so what, what would be the human touch? Well, as I mentioned, the good news is that there, there really is still a big, big gap, and I don't need to tell you folks, that humans are still way better than machines at, at difficult tasks. Um, especially the high-level ones like language, meaning, you know, cognition. You know, machines are getting fairly good at stuff like, you know, detecting a face in an image. Um, the bad news is, you know, why there's still a lot of work uh, to do is, although we know that people do better at tasks, we really don't know, you know, how that happens. We just know that something really special happens between our ears. But what? Uh -huh. um, and this is especially true for the high-level tasks that we actually really care about. So. So we're still, we're still stuck in a little bit of a bind. Okay, so what I'm going to uh, argue is that in this, I'm going to show at least one direction in which um, taking this human touch, saying what do we do, how can we so uh, attack a problem from a kind of human-centered perspective can give us something a little bit more than we're getting just from the machine-driven approach. Uh, which is not to say get rid of the machine-driven approach, just a way of kind of trying to extend beyond it. Okay. So uh, in order to do that, I'm going to talk about representations of meaning, the meanings of words, the meanings of sentences, um, and also uh, semantic similarity, semantic just being the jargon term for meaning. Uh, so you know, how similar the meanings of different words are. And, um, and a lot of this work, and I'll show some of this in a little bit, uh, Francisco has also done really nice work in this area with a lot of, a lot of overlap with this. I'll talk about that a bit too. Okay, so first of all, let's just you know, look at semantic similarity. Um, you know, what on earth is it, and you know, does our brain actually care about it at all? Okay, so here's a, here's a quick demo. This is probably more for the people who are actually in the room than the people who are listening remotely, but hello, people remotely. Okay, okay so I'm going to show you a list of words. They're going to flash up kind of quick. Okay, so everyone look. It's, this is flashing a lot on my screen. Is it flashing up there too? Yeah. Okay, all right. Well, hopefully not too many of them will disappear during the flash. Okay, okay. I'm going to show you a list of words. Try and remember as many as you can. Okay, ready? Okay. Okay, got that? All right, okay. Okay, uh, so here's a question. Someone shout out the answer from the audience. Okay, were any of the following words in that list? Any of those words in there? Someone shout it out nice and loud so the people in Spain can hear you. Or, or, or so that I can hear it. That would also be fun. Okay, wait. None of those words are in there? Well, you're a very unusual audience. <laughs> okay, so I was sort of expect. Okay, let, let's take a little... A little okay, um, let, how confident are you? Was, was soft not in there? Pretty confident. Okay, how about short? Sure in there. How about uh, sweet? Was that in there? Not sure? Okay, maybe? Okay, I'm so happy someone said that. Okay, smooth? Was smooth in there? Okay, okay. Would it be fair to say in your, in your heart of hearts, now we, we want full honesty here, come on. Okay, so you maybe think that sweet was in there just a little bit. Yeah, yeah, okay, thank you. Okay, usually somebody says with great confidence that sweet was in there, so I don't know what's up with you folks. But you, you, maybe, maybe. Well, you're all, you're all androids. This is my current working hypothesis. Okay, 
So, um, so in fact, uh, so sweet was actually not in there, okay, but a lot of uh, words related to sweet were in there, you know, sugar, taste, good, tooth, right? So, so if you people had normal human brains, which I'm quite frankly doubting, okay, then you would have formed a kind of gist memory of the idea that there was stuff to do with sweet things in there, um, and you would have said, hey, yeah, I think I do remember sweet being in there. And I actually, I didn't obviously invent this. This is a, a, a well-known effect in memory called the dies rodiger mcdermott effect. So if you're all deeply familiar with that, then I, I was unable to fool any of you. But I hope some of you people watching over the internet were, were fooled by that. Yeah, I think they were. Okay. Um, so, um, so now why did, why did people, so pretend for a minute that you, that you actually did think that sweet was in that list. Okay, why did you think sweet was in there? Think, I didn't think it was in there. I just memorized every single word that was in there. Um, well, because it's basically it's semantically similar to all those other words. Okay, so this is the first time I've done this demo that nobody actually was fooled by it. So I, you know, and people, I, I was, they told me, NIH people, they're different. You know, just watch out for them. Okay, and I, I, I didn't know that it was that it was a pretty serious problem. Okay, so. Um, so your brain captures some kind of overall measure of semantic similarity, saying these meanings are just kind of like that meaning. And your brain actually, maybe not your brains, but the brains of many normal functioning human beings actually uh, store that and, and care about it. Okay, so that's, that was meant to be a demo that semantic similarity is something that your brain cares about. Okay, so what can we use this to do? Okay. Well, one thing that I looked at was uh, trying to um, translate across different languages. You know, here in this room, I'm sure we have lots of people who speak lots of different native languages. I've already met uh, quite a few of them. Okay, but somehow we're able to communicate with each other. Not perfectly, but well enough that we can understand what's going on. Well, how does that happen? Somehow we, we can actually live in the same shared world, world of meaning, even though, you know, our mother tongues were <clears throat> completely different. Okay, so, you know, can we find, what is, if you, if you cover out semantics, then you could say, okay, the, you know, well, can, we, can we get at that kind of essence of meaning that's shared across different languages? And um, can, can we find that in the brain? And um, you know, even better, could we actually read that off from the brain? That would, be, that would be nice if we could achieve that. And this is work done with a former postdoc in my lab, Ben Zinza. Um, and so uh, I don't know if you, any of you are interested in philosophy, but it turns out there's a, an old paper by Paul Churchland in which he asked this question, if you have, um, People with different brains and uh, different representations of the world, how is it that they can actually represent the same thing? You know, how can people have a shared conceptual space? You know, my number, you know, even just basic things like the number of neurons in my head is just different from the number of neurons in your head. The dimensionality of the spaces is different. The way in which they're set up is different. My personal life experiences are different from yours. Yet somehow, somehow we're able to have shared representations. So what he actually suggested, just purely on conceptual grounds, which I think is pretty pretty impressive, is he said that, you know, maybe what actually matters here is not the, um, the, uh, the actual patterns themselves, which in these diagrams would be the kind of like the coordinates of these points in these boxes, but it's the relations between them, okay? So in this case, you know, you've, you've got the same kind of overall shape, which has the same set of structural relations between these points, and you've kind of rotated it around, and it's because even though every point is in a different spot, because the rela similarity relations between them are the same, that's how you can have conceptual similarity across sensory and neural diversity. Okay, so that was, that was his proposal on, on purely, purely uh, conceptual grounds. And I, I came across this after, actually after we'd, uh, we'd done this study, so I thought it was a kind of interesting convergence. Okay, so what we looked at is, suppose you have people who are um, native English speakers and native Chinese speakers, and they're both in the same world, and they're both talking about the same thing. So in this case, you know, they're both looking at a cat, and inside their mind, they're, they're both thinking cat, but they're thinking very different things okay? in, in terms of like the sound, in terms of the way it gets represented as a piece of writing. Okay, so phonologically and orthographically, these things are totally different, but at the level of semantics, the meaning thing is the same. Right? A Chinese cat is basically the same as an American cat. Okay? Um, so the question is that we ask is, can we use people's brains as a translation dictionary? Can we go between Chinese, could we figure out, if we had a whole bunch of Chinese words, or a relatively small set of Chinese words in this you know, initial study, and a set of their corresponding words in English, could we look at the brains of Chinese people reading the Chinese words, and of English people reading the English words, 
And by looking at the set of neural similarities between the activations that were listed by them reading these words and trying to match them up in a kind of neural similarity space, a little bit like that Paul Churchland picture, would we be able to actually figure out which English word corresponds to which Chinese word? And um, now you might think, you know, this probably is making you think of bilingualism. You know, it would be nice to, um, you know, take someone and there's plenty of such people around who say, you know, knows English and knows Chinese really well. And then you can just look inside the head of that, that person and you can say, you know, let's actually just look at the relationship between the neural representations inside this one person's head. And you can do that, and people have actually done that kind of study. But the thing is, the translation between the two different representations has actually been done not by us looking at the brain activation. The translation was done by the person. When the person learned, oh, okay, this is the Chinese word for cat and this is the English word for cat, they were the ones who did all the work of translation. Okay, we want to see if we can do the work of translation by actually reading the information off from, the, from neural activations in different people's heads. We want to take some Chinese people over here, some totally different English people over here, and see if those are the things that we can relate to each other. OK. Um, and uh, in order to do that, you need to, you're going to have to have a bunch of different words, because if it's the set of similarity relations that you're looking at, then you need to have like several different entities, right? So there's a kind of set of relations between them. You can't just have one word. Okay, um, because, and also if you, you know, if you only have one word, you might have things that kind of look like they relate to each other, but they might not actually have the same meaning. Okay, so here's an English, you know, here's one person looking at cat and thinking cat, here's someone else thinking meow. Meow is certainly a word that's sort of, you know, related to cat, but it isn't, it doesn't mean cat. Okay, so here's what we did. Okay, so we took a bunch of English people, we took a bunch of Chinese people, and uh, we, we, we showed English words to English people, and um, Chinese words to Chinese people measured their multivoxel activation patterns and, and then said, okay, for each of those patterns, you can uh, take just this plain old uh, spatial correlation between those multivoxel patterns. That's our measure of similarity. A very simple measure, which may be too simple in, in some ways. I had an interesting conversation with people about that today. But for this, for this, it seems to do the job. Okay? So make the neural similarity structure for each language and then see if we can match them across the different languages and see if we can use that matching to figure out which English words match, correspond to which Chinese words. And I'll show you a bit more detail in just a second what I mean by that matching. Um, and uh, this came out in General Cognitive Neuroscience not that long ago, if you want to get more detail. Um, okay, so, so, and this is just a picture of, you know, I, I don't think any of the folks here would really need to see this, but this is just a sort of cartoon of what um, multivoxel pattern analysis looks like. So you, um, you know, measures from, we, take some region of the brain. In this case, we actually took a whole bunch of different regions in the brain. You've got a pattern across those voxels, and then you can take the, um, the similarity across those patterns for the different, different words that are, are giving rise to activation. You can say, okay, here's the neural similarity of you know, the pattern listed by, say, the word ax, and the pattern listed by, say, the word room or raft or something like that. Okay? And you can see that in this case, you know, every word is perfectly similar with itself because it's the same word, but you know, it might have less similarity with, with other words, depending on how different their meanings are. Okay. Um, so the first question was, you know, which words should we use, which actually turned out to be not that easy because a whole bunch of different criteria. So, you know, we wanted concrete nouns because those were the ones that we had more hope of it working for. And we wanted a whole bunch of different types of objects just to get a little bit more coverage of kind of semantic space. We didn't want them to be ambiguous. That actually narrow, rules out a lot of stuff. We wanted them to be monosyllabic in English. It does, it's no good if you have like a you know, single character Chinese word that's like a big long English word. That would be like a confound there. Um, and, uh, and this was a slightly tricky. We want them to be infrequent enough that most Chinese speakers don't actually know the English translations. If you, you know, we, we couldn't pick, in the perfect experiment, we'd pick people who didn't, Chinese people who didn't know any English at all. But of course we couldn't do that because you know, they're in the United States, so they know some English. But if you pick kind of obscure-ish words, then you can, and we, we tested to make sure they didn't know this, then you can at least reduce, make it very, very unlikely that they're kind of unbeknownst to you secretly translating every word that they read in Chinese into English in their head so that what you, when you think you're measuring Chinese semantics, you're actually measuring English semantics. So we use kind of slightly obscure words. It turns out that these kind of like somewhat archaic words, these are all names of things that existed, you know, like, you know, a thousand years ago. Those tend to be actually words that meet all these properties. Okay, so here's the ones we had. So axe, broom, gown, hoof, jaw, mule, and raft. And, and those are the Chinese equivalents. And uh, if anyone here is a native Chinese speaker, uh, hopefully you can tell me that those are, are, are right or right enough that it's okay. A bunch of Chinese people have, have verified this. Okay, 
So, so we had, and notice this is only seven words, right? This is a very small subset of language, but the question is, would this work at all? Okay, so, um, so what we did was we presented those words and then we uh, viewed it as a similarity space. Now, I think many people here will already be familiar with this, but the idea is that, um, you know, the, this is actually a, you know, a, it's gonna make a, a seven by seven matrix of, you know, how similar is, is the neural pattern listed by X to broom, of X to gown, et cetera. Okay, so you end up with, um, you know, 20 something actual distinct pairs of similarities. So you've got a big 20 dimensional space. Well, that's kind of hard to look at. So you can represent it as a two dimensional space using multi dimensional scaling. And I'm sure many of you, you've probably all seen that before. Okay, so here is a picture of, um, if you average across the English speakers in this kind of similarity space, here's a, here's a, a, a picture of what their, um, their brain's representations of these words kind of look like. And you can see it's kind of reasonable. So X is pretty different from everything else. You know, hoof and jaw are kind of quite close to each other. Um, and, and here it is in, uh, in Chinese, in the Chinese speakers. And then if you look, I mean, the way in which this, I can go into details if people are interested. We didn't actually align it in this two-dimensional space. But if you look at it, you can sort of see that, you know, these different shapes do kind of match up with each other. And so here's one line overlaying on top of another. This is, if you pick the best, Set of, if you say what set of labels on these on these words, if I were to put an English word that I have to pair with this, and another English word that I have to pair with that, another English word that I have to pair with that, which pairing would produce the best match between this overall shape and that overall shape? Again, it turns out to be this, and the good news in this particular case is that actually does match the English words with their Chinese language equivalents. Okay, so what this means is that we've looked at the the, we've only looked at the, the brain data without knowing which words they came from. And we just said, okay, here's seven chunks of brain data from English people, seven chunks of brain data from Chinese speaking people. Please match them up to match the neural similarities. And then if we're lucky, it means that actually the words from the, the English, the, the ones are listed by the English words will match up with the ones listed by the equivalent Chinese words. And that turns out to work. So we were happy about that. And then you could say, okay, well, does this work everywhere? And the answer is no, but um, there's some, uh, there's some regions that it works particularly well. So for instance, some of kind of like parahippocampal type areas, which have been shown in other studies to be very important for semantic information. Whereas, you know, areas like visual cortex, primary visual cortex is very low degree of success of pairing them, which is sort of reassuring because we were trying to look at something purely semantic. We were uh, trying to abstract away from these kind of things that we don't care about as much, such as, um, you know, what do they look like when they're written down, which would, you know, which is obviously completely different for English and for, for Chinese, and you know, if that was driving it, then you'd expect to see much stuff in these more kind of much more success in these visual areas, which you don't get. Okay, so so far we've just talked about matching brain stuff against other brain stuff, and in fact, actually, it turns out that if you want the best model for activation, uh, and other people have found this as well, if you want the best model for activation uh, elicited in one person's brain. You know, some kind of computational model is not really going to cut it. The best that model for that is activation listed in someone else's brain. It's really hard to beat that. I mean, it's not completely satisfactory because you still don't necessarily ha know how that activation got there. But pe different people do match up fairly well. Okay. But, um, you know, so far we've been using, you know, we were looking at the meanings of words and you would say, well, that's not the only way of representing the meanings of words. We actually do have computational models that represent the meanings of words and they do it pretty well. So let's talk about some of that. So, um, so what is a semantic model? A semantic model is a way of saying, here's some numbers that represent the meanings of a word. And the question is, well, you know, where do those numbers come from? And there's, um, there's kind of two main approaches. And here's where we're gonna get to the, um, the distinction I was drawing between the, um, you know, the kind of like copying AI type approach versus doing something that's more kind of driven by humans and seeing if that gives you a little bit more of an extra boost, okay? So uh, a computer-based approach is you have a text-based model. I'll talk in a, a, a bit more about what that actually means. Um, and uh, human-produced uh, approaches, you, you get people to give you behavioral ratings of the meanings of their words. Um, okay, so, so what, does, um, what would a computer-type uh, model look at? Well, it, it's based on this, there's this famous saying by this guy called Firth from the 50s who said, um, you know, this is a, it's a nice line, he said, you shall know a word by the company it keeps. In other words, if you want to know what the meaning of a word is, go and see what other words it hangs out with and look at their meanings 
And if you, if you kind of tally up a count of which words tend to hang out with each other, that's actually a pretty good measure of what those words mean. It has many imperfections, we'll get to that in a minute, but it turns out to work reasonably well. And this is a very easy thing for computers to do, especially these days that you can have a text corpus, which is just a jargon term for like a big chunk of words, right? So like the World Wide Web or Wikipedia or something like that. So Francisco, for instance, has done some really nice uh, mining of, um, of meanings from Wikipedia. And you know, 20 years ago, it was much harder to get your hands on this kind of data set. Now they're, they're easy to come by, okay? So a computer can, you know, might take a little bit of CPU time, but it can churn through these billions or even trillions these days of words, and it can say how often the different words hang out with each other and then those can make, those give you a bunch of numbers and those become your semantic feature vector, right? which is just jargon way of saying a bunch of numbers trying to capture some meaning. So, um, so for instance, suppose you said, okay, the words I want to see how often they hang out, how often they hang out with things, I might look for, you know, the, my, my kind of target words might be say concrete noun, um, such as like hammer or celery and the words I want to see how often they hang out with might be say action words, this is from, uh, Tom Mitchell's study from 2008, which I'll show in a minute, like, you know, break and touch and eat. And, you know, not too surprisingly, hammer kind of co-occurs a lot more with touch than it does with eat, whereas celery is kind of the other way around. So you can already see at this very coarse level, you're capturing, you know, you're capturing something about the meaning of hammer that it's more to do with touch than it is with eat, and something about the meaning of celery that's the other way around. Okay, so this is known as, uh, the jargon term is just distributional semantics, or, um, you know, it goes by various other names as well. Often they get called word embeddings these days. But this is a kind of computer-based approach for um, representing meaning. And, and this was uh, first used for decoding brain activation in a really beautiful paper that came out in Science 2008 by Tom Mitchell. There's just lots and lots of things that I like about this paper. Um, one of the, well, it was the first paper to use the semantic model to decode brain activation. You know, really triggered a lot of work, including work that I did, work that Francisco did. And this is a work with Tom Mitchell as well. Um, uh, the data is online, which is something I know that you folks here at NIH are doing a lot of as well. This is one of the early examples of that. And um, also another thing I really like about it is it was very simple. You know, what, what, you know Tom Mitchell was the, the founding chair of the machine learning department at CMU. So, you know, he knows a thing or two about machine learning. So you might think, oh, he's going to use some super fancy model, super sophisticated model to do his decoding. He used linear regression. You know, I mean, basically high school level math. I don't know if they teach that in high school, but you know, pretty simple math, nothing fancy. Uh, he reached for the very simplest tool in his toolkit, and, and it worked really quite well. So, you know, in, in over the last 20 years or so, 30 years, there's been a lot of approaches, and it, did, it really did start in cognitive science, uh, of, of uh, trying to represent the meanings of words um, using uh, distributional semantics. In other words, like looking how often the words hang out with each other in the same sentence or in the same document, and kind of like having, having kind of more and more sophisticated ways of doing it. These days, the way it gets done by things like word to vec uh, and love is not so much to just kind of count how often words hang out with each other, but to kind of try and predict um, surrounding words using uh, your, your target word which actually turns out surprisingly works a lot better than actually just counting current occurrences. But, and this is very widely used. This, this is the basis, if you, you know, use Google Translate or something like that, or if you speak to Alexa, somewhere inside there, something like this is being used. One of the, so they're powerful and they work. Okay, so these are, but still, this is the kind of non-human touch. Okay, this is derived by, you know, taking a whole bunch of, of text and just kind of, you know, plugging it into a computer program and seeing what comes out the other end. Um, and this can really be very powerful. So here's, you know, this really nice paper that uh, Francisco and his colleagues came out with um, pretty recently. And, you know, uh, what they did is they sort of said, let's kind of tile semantic space. And this is, you're not going to see, so here's a, here's a kind of blown up version. And you can see there's all these kind of different regions of semantic space where the position in the space is driven by what the, 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 the distributional semantic vectors for these words are. And you can see the words that have similar kind of meanings sort of clustered together. So here around driver, which is the kind of central concept, there's a whole bunch of words like car, truck, traffic, accident, that kind of hang out with driver. Right? And then if you move over a little bit, then you get different things like, you know, fisherman hangs out with fish and bait and boat, which also hangs out with ship. So there's a sort of real kind of sensible structure here. And so what Francisco and his colleagues said was, you know, let's try and kind of, you know, use these computer-based uh, models to really kind of, you know, tile a big bunch of semantic space, so potentially you could use this to decode all kinds of things, 
and, and it works really quite nicely. You know, this is also a really nice study. You can also get the, the data from this, and people have done some nice work based on that as well. Okay. So um, what we did was we took a slightly different approach, related but a little bit different. We tried to take more of a kind of human human based angle. We said we asked, can that can that give us anything? And apart from just the fact that, you know, I like human beings, there's, a, there's also some more motivation for that, which is that, you know, all of these computer based models fundamentally rely on the idea of looking at, um, you know, words that hang out together have similar meaning, which is entirely reasonable, right? You know, fishermen and, and boat, they hang out together and they do have similar meaning. Okay? But the problem is that there's a little bit more to um, similarity of meaning than just hanging out together. So for instance, okay, here's a, you know, can you really know a word's meaning by the company it keeps? You know, is that enough? Right? So here's, here's a couple of words that I've had quite a lot of contact with today, and I'm thank, thank you to Javier and other people for getting them for me. Okay, coffee and cup. Right? Coffee and cup are words that hang out with each other a lot, right? especially around here. Okay? Um, but okay, they don't mean exactly the same thing. Right? If you worked in Starbucks and you thought that coffee meant the same as cup, right, you'd have a lot of accidents. Okay? Right? You'd get fired pretty quickly. Right? There'd be stuff spilling all over the floor. So they have very related meaning, but nonetheless, they're actually very distinct things. One of them's like hot, wet, and brown, and the other one is kind of you know, hard, you know, has a kind of con con contained stuff and is white and made of china or something like that. Okay? Um, Similarly, you can have words that, that hang out with each other that actually have completely opposite meanings. Like, what's a word that hangs out a lot with good? Well, all kinds of things, but, you know, one of them is evil, right? You know, beyond good and evil, right? Well, you know, good and evil definitely hang out a lot together, but they don't have similar meanings. In fact, they have meanings that are kind of about as different as you can get, right? The antonyms in the, in the jargon term. And then you can also have, you can also have words that, this is actually an example from the Tom Mitchell study. Uh, you can also have words that hang out with, um, slightly unexpected uh, kind of um, neighbors. So, you know, we talked, for instance, about how, like, celery hangs out a lot with the word eat, right? So you might think, well, you know, of all these different action words, carrot would hang out a lot with eat as well, right? But in the Tom Mitchell data, it actually turns out that the, the word um, that um, carrot, co the, the action verb that carrot co-occurs with the most frequently is not eat, but is actually, like, if the screen is up, okay, is actually the word approach. Which you think I mean, it seems kind of weird. Can anyone say why? Anyone any guesses as to why why the word carrot hangs out with the word approach more than eat? Anyone snuck up on a carrot recently? This might this might require a native English speaker. Can anyone think of of circumstances in which carrot and approach? Yeah, I, I think I see a hand there. A carrot and stick approach, exactly. Okay, so if you think about the word carrot, okay, it turns out, somewhat surprisingly, to me, it surprised me at least, okay, that the most common usage of the word carrot when people talk about it, at least in, you know, when people write sentences about it, is not to say, oh, I ate a carrot today. I mean, how often do you find yourself saying that, right? Okay, but it's to say, we're going to take a carrot and stick approach, right? So, you know, the, 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 the way in which words hang out with each other doesn't necessarily, but if I were to say, what does the word carrot mean, okay? You know, you probably, you know, you're probably your first answer would be, well, it's this kind of, you know, orange elongated vegetable. You know, you probably wouldn't say, oh, carrot, yeah, that's the thing that people frequently refer to in a metaphor about ways of motivating people, right? I mean, even though that's actually the most, you know, the way in which it gets used the most, right? Um, uh, another example is, uh, for instance, like uh, the most common usage of the word up is not like that kind of direction that moves away from the ground, right? The most common usage of the word up is in things like I tidied up, hey, hurry up, right? None of which actually involve like things moving in an upwards direction, right? But that's, that's actually how it gets used. Okay, so, um, so there's a little bit more to, to meaning than, um, than co-occurrence. Well, if, you, if all you're looking at is a co-occurrence, well, how can you get at that? Okay, so um, well, one way you can get at it is you can actually ask people, hey, tell me some things about the meaning of this word, right? Actually ask real human beings. So this was work done in collaboration with um, uh, Jeff Binder and Leo Fernandino and, and others and building on some really nice work. The jargon term for like asking people these things is, is semantic feature norms. I don't know why they're called that, but if, so if you see something talking about norms, that means stuff that human beings were involved in making. Okay? Um, so, uh, and this, this work on using it to decode sentences, which I'll show you in just a minute, was work that was led by a former postdoc in my lab, Andy Anderson. Here's a couple of his papers. Um, okay, so what kinds of things did we ask people? Okay, so it started off in, in kind of broad brush sensory motor type 
um, uh, domains, things like uh, sound, color, motion, shape, and manipulation. Okay, very similar actually to Tom Mitchell's kind of action words, which is not an action. Okay, so you might say, give someone a word like, uh, you know, football, and you might say, you know, to what degree does football induce, um, you know, ideas of sound? And you might say, well, not very much, right? Well, how much does it relate to movement? Oh, quite a lot, right? How much does it relate to shape? Oh, yeah, quite a lot. Football kind of has a shape, right? So, you know, so fairly kind of direct ways, but this actually captures, you know, some aspects of what it's like to actually kind of physically interact with these things, right? This is where the meanings of coffee and cup would actually give you very different answers, even though they hang out with each other a lot. Um, so, and you can tell that actually, you know, for things like tomato or alarm, like alarm has a lot of sound stuff going on it, obviously, it works great. So, you know, more abstract words, and we'll get to this a bit later too, you know, you can imagine they, you know, they don't have as many sensory properties, but even they have sensory properties, like gravity, for instance, you know, has more of a sense of motion than the other things. Okay, so now five dimensions of, you know, sound, color, motion, shape, manipulation, that's okay, but, you know, life is more complicated than that. So then we said, okay, well, how about if you have, um, you know, broader set of uh, kind of uh, perceptual uh, dimensions? So we call it ag experiential attributes. In other words, like stuff that you would experience if you kind of interacted with these words. Right? And so, as well as being the other ones, we also broadened it to include, you know, sensory, motor, spatial, social, emotional, cognitive. Um, and so this potentially cover increases the range of different meanings that we can cover. A little bit like how in that picture from Francisco's paper, you know, they tried to kind of span a bigger set of the semantic space by kind of tiling it. Um, okay, so, um, so we covered events as well as objects, abstract as well as uh, concrete concepts. Um, and if you're interested, you know, here's like the full list. So it included, you know, more kind of abstract things like, you know, human communication, self-cognition number. You know, and some words actually will induce more sense of those than it would of things like, you know, loud or high or bright and stuff like that. Okay. Um, so, so we use this to uh, uh, decode not just individual words, but also sentences. And um, this at the time hadn't been done. So, the, you know, one of the challenges was, well, you know, Tom Mitchell had shown in his beautiful study that you can take individual words, you present them one at a time, get people to think about those words, and you can actually kind of decode using your semantic model uh, some evidence of what that word is. But the problem is if someone's reading a whole sentence, they have a whole bunch of different words all represented in their head all at the same time, and they're all kind of mooshed together, especially with fMRI with its kind of slow temporal resolution. So you have this kind of big overlapping bunch of different representations all in there at the same time, and we really didn't know if we'd actually still be able to pull them out. Okay. Um, but we said, okay, well, let's give it a shot. So we're gonna try and, uh, we're gonna scan people reading full sentences, try and uh, use that to estimate their responses to individual words and try and put those words back together again to make new sentences and see if we can decode those better than chance. Um, and uh, the backstory for this, and, and uh, Francis, uh, we, this was actually a, a study funded at the time by IARPA, which is kind of like the sort of intelligence branch of DARPA. Uh, and uh, I, w I was fortunate enough to be in a team with Jeff Binder and some colleagues from industry as well. Uh, one of the other teams was led by Francisco, and um, it was kind of an interesting experience. One thing that was a bit weird about it, um, well, the main thing that was a bit weird about it was that, uh, you know, about a year into the project, IAPA took all our money away, which, uh, you know, but, uh, uh, which was, you know, slightly unfortunate, but they did that to other groups too, so I didn't feel too bad. But, um, but they, they actually forced us to use a specific list of stimuli, which were actually way more complicated than I would have personally chosen. But I think in the imbalance has actually turned out to be a good thing. So in the Chinese-English study, we had this very small set of very carefully selected words, okay? So the plus side is, you know, we had nice control over these stimuli and they met all these conditions. The downside is we only had seven words, okay? So um, instead, the uh, IOPA gave us loads and loads of sentences. You might say, well, you know, who cares about sentences? Um, well, you know, obviously language is more complicated than individual words. Uh, you could just view language as just a sort of stream of text, an unbroken stream. And in fact, people, you know, for instance, Jack Gaunt's work has done very nice work looking in that way. You, you, you don't really look at the kind of boundaries of sentences. You just say, you know, people are listening to stuff like their podcasts and just a whole bunch of words coming in a row. Let's just kind of model that. But there is something distinct about sentences. I mean, they do are real linguistic units. You know, their boundaries are actually important. So for instance, if I say, you know, I met the man, the dog ate, you know, that's really a different thing from saying I met the man, the dog ate. So, you know, sentences are actually kind of linguistically important things, so, so we concentrate on that. And also because, you know, our funders told us to, but I think it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a worthwhile thing to look at. And, and they gave us lots and lots of different sentences. 
Okay, and all, many of which were kind of, you know, contained all kinds of abstract words and nouns and verbs and do, you know, some of them are fairly simple, like the feather was blue. You know, you can imagine our experiential attributes are going to be pretty good for that one. Oh yeah, you know, blue is a nice sensory thing. Uh, but some of them are a bit more difficult, you know, like, you know, the banker watched the peaceful protest or, you know, the dangerous criminal stole the television. You know, or, you know, this is a good one for NIH. The clever scientist worked at the lab. Okay, you know, there's, there's some pretty abstract things going on here. So, um, so, we, so we gave people, and there's a lot of different sentences. So we, we put people in a scanner, we presented these sentences to them, uh, and we actually um, just scanned their brains when they were reading the entire sentence. So we just had this big kind of mixture of all these different representations in their head at the same time. Um, and um, we had to scan people a lot because you want to, you know, present each one a whole bunch of times. So these poor unfortunate subjects actually came back for like six consecutive MRI sessions. Um, you know, we had a lot of trouble with attrition, as you might imagine, but eventually we actually managed to do it. We don't really know if this was completely necessary or not, but that's what we did. Okay. So, and then we had, um, we had actually different people on Mechanical Turk, Amazon Mechanical Turk, just give us a whole bunch of perceptual ratings for all these words as well. Okay. So we now have um, our semantic model, which is based on human beings giving ratings of these words according to our 65 different experiential attributes. And um, we have uh, MRI, fMRI recordings of people actually reading these sentences. Now the problem is that we, we want to build new sentences out of these words, but we don't have the individual words. We just got the responses to sentences. Okay, so you say, well, how, how are you going to get around that? Well, we did uh, a pretty simple thing. We just said, okay, suppose you want to you know, say get the fMRI representation of, say, the word eat. You know, just give me all of the sentences that contain the word eat or ate or something like that and just average them together, okay. which in many ways is kind of crude, um, but despite being crude, you know, this is our first attempt, you know, anyone's first attempt to decode sentences, it actually kind of works okay, um, surprisingly. Similarly, you know, just, you know, if I want to get the representation of the word dog, give me all the sentences that had dog in it, just average them together. So we, um, we, we, uh, then we had our models of individual words, and then we could, uh, I'm going to skip a little bit of detail, okay, and then we relate that to our semantic model. We say, okay, each of those words has, um, you know, a 65 element semantic feature vector for all this kind of sensory type stuff that people on Mechanical Turk said that they associate with dog, right? And then you say, okay, now you can give me a new sentence with some new words in it. I can predict the brain activation for the new word by getting its features in that model and kind of relating that to the, um, the voxels associated with those features just with regression, right? And I can build up a new sentence by sticking a whole bunch of new words together. And then you say, okay, well, what's our neural representation of a sentence? And here again, you know, what is the kind of coarsest, simplest, crudest possible representation of the meaning of a sentence? It's just the meaning of, um, meanings of all the individual words in that sentence just averaged together which has many, many imperfections. You know, it won't be able to tell you the difference between the dog chased the cat and the cat chased the dog, but for, you know, we didn't have those kind of sentences. For actually, a lot of sentences actually work okay. Again, you know, these are, these are kind of a first stab at the problem. Okay, so then we just average together those new words, and this is our prediction for the new sentence. And then the question is, and then we did a kind of cross-validation. We'll skip the details of that, but it's pretty standard. Okay, and then the question is, well, you know, does this actually work? Uh, and, and, you know, and which parts of the brain were actually containing information that was actually allowed us to, to decode and reconstruct new sentences? And the answer is it was very broadly distributed. This is very consistent with what Francisco and other groups have found. You know, we originally thought, hey, we've got these kind of, you know, visual features. I bet that they're more concentrated in visual cortex and our auditory features. I bet they're more featured in auditory cortex. But no, everything was all over the place. And in fact, the, by far the, you know, the, if you were to pick one particular area, it was this kind of big swathe of like uh, the left superior temporal sulcus, which is a very mo multimodal kind of area, which actually was the best region for decoding. But in fact, brain-wide, there was information all over the place. So the, the punchline is that um, it, despite all of the kind of simplifications we've done, this did actually decode sentences, and, uh, and our semantic model actually worked, and, it, and the information seems to be all over the brain. Okay. Um, and now another other approach, so for instance, Francisco's paper and Mark Tolgeus group have also found kind of similar types of things that you can indeed, but they, the, the difference is that they use these computer-derived semantic features. 
So then the question is, okay, we use the, you know, we were all proud of ourselves for having this kind of, you know, human, you know, artisanal, human-created, you know, uh, human-centric features, have they actually given us anything? Was there any point of us doing this? Why don't we just use a nice off-the-shelf, you know, computational set of features which work really well, they drive Google Translate and stuff like that. You know, did we gain anything? So that's what this, this, this recent paper just came out recently in Journal of Neuroscience basically said, you know, was it worth it? You know, was it worth it adding in these experiential features? And uh, the answer, and so there's this new paper, Integrated Neural Decoder of Linguistic and Experiential Meaning, and the answer is, yeah, it kind of helps a bit. To, to, to give you a spoil. Okay, so the two, so basically we combine these two types of models. Okay, so we've got our experiential model, uh, which, you know, draws in all these kind of sensory type features, and we've got our linguistic, which means our text-based model, it means it was kind of scraped from text corpora. I think we used uh, word to vec. Okay, and then we just combine them together. And the way in which we combine them was, we, we combined everything, in this particular study, we combined everything in a, a kind of similarity space, very much like in that Chinese-English approach uh, that I showed you before, but you can, you can do it other ways as well. Um, you know, the main, the main factor was, you know, we use these two different types of models. Okay. And then, you know, as you can tell, because I'm talking about it, you do actually do better if you combine them together than if you have them separately. So the blue line here is the text-based model. Each, each line here is like one individual subject. Um, the, um, the orange one is the experiential model, like from asking human beings. And when you combine them, you do a little bit significantly, but not by a huge amount, better than either of them on their own. So there's, there's something value added, right? Like it could easily have been the case that, you know, combining these would just give the average of the two models, which would actually be a little bit worse than the better performing one. But in fact, you know, luckily it does actually help with this. Um, and then the interesting question is, you know, well, you know, how much are they contributing? Where are they contributing? So we, we partitioned the variance of our model, which because it was just a kind of simple linear model you can do, and we said, you know, which parts of it are explained by the text-based model, which parts of it are explained by the experiential, which parts of it are explained by the, the overlap between them, and, you know, does, do, you know, what extra value are we getting from these different parts, okay? And it turns out that actually there was a pretty decent-sized chunk. Uh, in this case, it was about, you know, 41% of the variance, but it varied, you know, for different subjects. Uh, so here in the, in the left inferior frontal gyrus, the very kind of high-level semantic area, you know, a pretty decent chunk of the meaning actually came from the experiential model. Um, in this case, a little bit more than the text-based model. But, um, but in general, you know, it, the, the, this extra model that came from human beings really was doing some work. And then, um, as you, you know, we, we kind of pointed out earlier that the, the, the places where the, the kind of purely text-based model really doesn't do so well is when an important part of the meaning is, you know, how you actually interact with a word, like the difference between coffee and cup. And similarly, you know, a part, part where this experiential model kind of doesn't do too well is in really, conc uh, really abstract words that you don't, you know, you can't hold the meaning of, you know, clever scientist in your hand, right? That's, that's, that's not really particularly experiential, it's more abstract. So this, you know, leads to the prediction that, you know, the more abstract the word, um, the more it's going to be supported by the, um, the text-based model, and the more concrete it is, uh, the more it's going to be supported by the experiential model. And we found that as well. It's not a huge effect, but, but you know, it, 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 was, it was significant. So, um, okay, so what does this tell us? Well, what it says is that, you know, the most important thing is you really can use models to capture neural representations. That's, that's not news to you folks. Many of you are doing that. You're doing beautiful work doing that. Okay? Um, you know, it turns out that a very kind of simple idea is that the neural similarity in the brain, namely, just the, the plain old pattern correlation between different neural patterns listed by different words really does match, not perfectly, but well enough that you can decode with it the semantic similarity of the words themselves. And this matches well enough that you can even translate across different languages with it, albeit so far we've only shown that just for seven words. Um, uh, this doesn't just work for individual words. You can do it for entire sentences, even though all these different representations are all kind of mushed together simultaneously in someone's head. Uh, although this is a very simple way of, you know, you literally just average the meanings together to try and get the meanings of a sentence from the meanings of the words. So there's a lot of scope left there. You know, what I think the main point I'm trying to make here is that um, even though the, these kind of machine learning, computer-generated semantic models such as word to vec and Glove are very powerful, there really is still extra value from asking human beings stuff, you know. We as human beings can understand meaning a lot better than any machine can at present and probably for a long time to come. And there's aspects of that representation meaning that the best way to get it is just take a bunch of people and ask them. And if you say, you know, if we, if we add this to our models, does this help us to uh, interpret human brain data? The answer is yes. 
you know, not by a huge amount, but by a significant amount. So we were happy about that. Okay, so it gives you a little bit of additional explanatory power. Um, so maybe, you know, people are always saying that, uh, you, know, uh, you know, artificial general intelligence is just around the, the corner, although, you know, they're kind of exaggerating. But, you know, maybe there's still a little bit of a, even though cognitive science and neuroscience are, uh, are not really, you know, at the forefront of what everyone finds kind of hot and exciting these days, you know, maybe they're not obsolete just yet. Uh, obviously, there's lots and lots of things left uh, untouched by it. So, for instance, we remarked that, you know, our representation of a sentence, just the average of the meanings of the words in that sentence, completely ignores word order and syntax, right? It, this, this is completely unable to distinguish between the cat chased the dog and the dog chased the cat, which is a pretty important aspect of language. Although, actually, if you think about it, it's surprisingly how rare sentences like that turn up, right? You, you actually have to have two different agents in your in your sentence. If you have a perfectly everyday kind of sentence like, you know, suppose I say, here's just a bag of unordered words like, you know, street, drove, car, man, right? You totally know what that sentence says, even though you don't know the order of the words, right? There's no way the car was driving the man, and the man was driving the car. So, in fact, even, even in, I think that's why this horribly crude idea of just ignoring word order actually kind of works okay, but, you know, clearly there's a lot of uh, space left uh, there. Um, there's many, many very subtle things that language does. For instance, pragmatics. You know, if someone says to you, you know, how would you like your tea? They're not expecting you to say in a cup, right? They're expecting you to say, uh, with some sugar, please, right? Even though they never explicitly say, by the way, I wasn't really asking what you would like added to your tea. So, um, you know, nobody knows how to capture that at present in the brain. Nobody knows how to capture that very well with these kind of models. Similarly, it's a terribly difficult problem if you represent everything in terms of vectors to actually show that one sentence logically follows from another one. Right? Vectors are just a bunch of numbers that kind of associate with each other. There's no, there's no kind of clean logical relations between them. Um, and another question some people ask is, you know, what about if different people experience the meaning of a word in different ways? This would be a fun study to do. We haven't done it yet. And I suppose like, you know, suppose I really love dogs, but you really hate dogs because, you know, you had a bad experience with a dog when you were a child, which could be relevant clinically, for instance, right? You know, your representation of the meaning of dog is going to be pretty different from mine, and it would be interesting to find kind of neural correlates of that. I don't think people have really done that yet, but that could be an exciting thing to look at. So, so there's lots and lots of, so, you know, I, I hope I've you know, convinced you that there's something interesting going on in, in looking at um, language in the brain. There's just a little tiny bit of it that we as the human race currently understand, but, um, and even though, Google Translate works pretty well. Alexa works pretty well. I think that you know, trying, still trying to hammer away at how the human beings actually do this so much better could still have some value to it. So thanks very much.